OK, let's take a look at the questions and share what I have discovered when talking with you. Question one, the dude is obviously crazy, but how? So some a lot of you chose this question. This was today's most popular question. Uh, some mentioned the beginning, the beginning where he strenuously denies that he's crazy. And basically, if somebody keeps denying that they're crazy, this could be a sign that they are crazy. So he begins by saying true, which means you're right. So he begins the story by talking to somebody. Talking to the reader, maybe. Talking to somebody in his jail cell, maybe. Or maybe even just talking to himself. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. Now, today, nervous just means afraid for the future. But in those days, nervous meant easily scared, easily um, frightened. Like uh, today in Chinese, we call this zi, right? which is uh, the, the root of the word nervous, nerve. A nerve is the part of your body that has sensations. Like if you feel something or you see something, those are all because of nerves. So nervous is where you like feel too much and you're worried too much. So it's the meaning is slightly different from today. So when he says, I was dreadfully nervous, it does not mean he was very anxious. It means that he was uh, like afraid of everything. So yes, I was dreadfully nervous, but why will you say that I am mad? So yes, I am. I have this kind of personality, but that doesn't make me crazy. The disease had sharpened my senses, so being nervous made me more aware. Had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute, so my best sense was my sense of hearing. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? I think he's answering his own question. <laughs> If you can hear things in heaven and throughout the earth and also in hell, I would also think you are kind of mad. Um, but this is interesting. He's, when he says, I'm not crazy because being nervous made me more aware, he's assuming that crazy people are less aware. Um, like, I think he's, he's mixing up being crazy and being stupid. Um, but here, he is crazy in the sense of being too aware. And he continues, hearken, which means listen, and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Again, if somebody came up to me and said, I'm going to tell you a story very healthily, I would also think something is kind of wrong. If uh, Somebody running for president of the United States went on stage and said that I am a stable genius. I would also think there's something kind of wrong there. And yes, I'm talking about Donald Trump. Uh, so all the, even from the beginning, we see that he's not quite right. He's, he's something's going on here. Um, and then many people. Uh, so here he says, mad men know nothing. So again, he has this idea of being crazy. That is not what we usually think of when we say that somebody is crazy. Um, and then the main idea of this story, uh, he wants to kill this guy. But it was not the old man who vexed me, who, who like made me feel this way, but his evil eye. So like apparently he has some objection to this old man's eye. He calls it the vulture eye. Now, I, I have not seen the eye of a vulture before, but I think the meaning here is it's a kind of symbol of death. Vultures, of course, eat dead animals, and so they wait for animals to die. Sometimes uh, in legend, vultures cause animals to die. Um, so like calling it a vulture eye, calling it an evil eye is saying that this eye represents some kind of danger, 
some kind of harm. Uh, and one group said that the protagonist thinks this eye has supernatural powers. Uh, all of which is pretty crazy. And then uh, some groups mentioned how careful, how detailed his plan is to kill this old man. Uh, so like he secretly enters the guy's room every night for a week. Uh, and like the way that he enters. Where was it? The way that he enters is really, really strange. Here. Uh, let's see, where was it? Here we go. OK, so I'm on page 12. So he carefully opens the door very, very slowly. And then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I first put in a dark lantern, so a lantern that is covered up. All closed, closed, so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. So he didn't just put his head in the door. He put his head in the door in a very clever way. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening of the door. Again, that seems pretty crazy to me. Can you imagine like opening the door just a little bit and you spend a whole 60 minutes moving your head inside the door? So yeah, so his planning, his detail, all of these are very obsessive is a word that many groups used. Obsessive to the point of being crazy. And then on the eighth night, when he enters, the old man somehow notices uh, and sits up, but our protagonist doesn't stop. Let's see, where was it? It doesn't say, oh, it says somewhere. I can't find it. But he decides to keep going, even though the old man is now awake. Um, so one group mentioned that it is at this point where the protagonist starts to lose control of himself. If he really were a perfectly reasonable and rational person, he would have given up and tried again the next night. But no, he keeps going. Um, see if I can find it. Now, nah, whatever. Anyway, he somewhere in there it says that he he most people would give up, but not him. He went. He continued. Um, and then also, at the very last moment when he opens the lantern, his thumb slips. Where is it? Am I on the wrong page? Um, yeah, anyway, so he opens the lantern and his thumb slips, and that's what um, makes the old man sit up. Here we go. I was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening. So, like, he is almost going to succeed, and here he makes a very simple mistake despite the fact that he has been so careful the entire week. Uh, so this is where that group mentioned he starts to lose control. Uh, and we also have another hint. This group pointed out that he felt a sense of triumph. And that is probably, here we go, contain my feelings of triumph. 
And this is probably why he started losing control. He's so obsessed with killing this guy and destroying his evil eye. He's when he's just about to succeed, he gets so overwhelmed by his own feelings of triumph that he his thumb slips a little and almost ruins the chance. Uh, the old man awakens. I think uh, most of us can relate, right? We're waiting for something for so long, and it, when it's finally here, it's so hard to control ourselves. But here, the contrast is so great. The, the gap is so big. Usually, he's such a crazily careful guy, and here, his feelings are so strong that he uh, slightly loses control of his body. Um, you know, ordinary differences pushed to extremes uh, could be a sign of craziness. Okay, and then finally, of course, the second half of the story when the police come, uh, he at first behaves perfectly, perfectly innocent, right? The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them, my behavior. I was singularly at ease. Okay, great. So he fooled the police officers. They can go home now. But no, uh, he in fact asked them to sit down, asked them to like, he started chatting with them actively. Uh, and then he starts hearing the sound of beating heart. And this of course is the main sign that he's crazy. He hears the sound of the old man's beating heart. Uh, and um, one group mentioned that this could be, like, why would he suddenly hear this sound? Uh, and this group said maybe it's because he is actually feeling guilty, but he, his mind does not understand the feeling of guilt. So it's like he's repressing his guilt, and his guilt is coming up through a different way. Uh, if he can't face his guilt, his body will remind him that he's guilty. And that's why he hears the beating heart. One reason Poe is such a great horror author is because he uses these very modern ideas of psychology. Someone uh, once said that uh, Freud actually stole from Alan Poe. Uh, there are a lot of similar ideas about like mental processes happening when we don't observe them. Our mind works in ways we don't understand. All of these very Freudian psychoanalytical ideas, uh, many of them appear in his stories. So this could be one of them, right? He doesn't admit his guilt, so his mind reminds him of his guilt by making him hear the sound of the beating heart. Uh, and it's also a symbol that his mind is divided against itself. It's not one mind, it's two minds, right? The one telling us the story tells us he's in control, he's fine, he's perfectly normal. But then the other half of his mind is the one that makes him say, like, I can hear things in hell. I can I heard the sound of the dead man's beating heart. Um, and so, like, it's very similar to what today we call the unconscious. Question two, why don't the police officers react? So let's go to page yeah, 14, this paragraph, the last paragraph on page 14. So this is after he starts hearing the sound of the heart. And notice that, of course, the police don't hear the sound of the heart, but they see him and they see his behavior go uh, grow ever more agitated. So let's look at this. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Now, fluent. Talking fluently is a good thing. What does it mean to say that you talk more fluently? If you are already talking fluently and then you talk more fluently, I think here it means he talks faster. Uh, and then here, I gasped for breath. 
and yet the officers heard it not. This is also a very interesting sentence. The, he means that the police did not hear the beating heart, but we readers can also think the officers do not hear him gasp for breath, or maybe they pretend not to hear him gasp for breath. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, which means more energy. I arose, so he stands up, and argued about trifles, small meaningless things, in a high key, which means like a high voice, and with violent gesticulations. So his body language is kind of violent. It's moving with so much energy. Uh, and it seems like the police don't react, right? He says, why would they not be gone? Why don't they go? So it seems like the police don't ask him, like, are you OK? They don't ask, they don't ask him more questions about the disappeared old man. They kind of sit there and just chat. So the discussion question is why? Why do the police seem like they're not reacting to our ever more agitated protagonist? I heard two answers, basically. One answer is they notice that our protagonist is getting more and more crazy and they deliberately decide not to do anything. It's like setting a trap. They can tell that this guy is suspicious. He's probably hiding something. And so they're just sitting there waiting for him to see what he's going to do, to see if this man will end up giving them more information. And of course he does, right? At the end of the story, the protagonist says, fine, fine, you win. I did it. I killed the guy. Uh, he really had no reason to confess except that he's crazy. So this could be a deliberate police strategy. In fact, uh, recent studies have shown that, you know, when you see like a Hollywood movie, they grab somebody they think is the bad guy. They put him in a dark room, shine a light in his face and say, did you do it? Right. Turns out that doesn't work. Turns out the more aggressive the police are, the less likely that person will admit that they did it. The more effective way is just like in this story, just chat with the person, you know, have a cup of coffee, talk about their lives, get to know them, have a conversation. And then in many cases, the suspect will want to share this secret with somebody that they think they can trust. Even when they know they are talking to the police, there is already such a connection there that the suspect feels like, you know, even though they're police, maybe they will help me get a lighter sentence. Maybe they'll, uh, uh, it would be better than like being caught if I just confess. Maybe they will treat me better. And so, in fact, having a conversation with somebody is the best way to get them to confess just like in this story. The second answer that I heard is that the police are maybe stupid and or lazy. Uh, stupid if they don't notice anything. Lazy if they do notice, but you know, no news is good news. We don't want it to cause any trouble. If we can like if if we can make this whole thing disappear, that would be the best thing to do. And of course, uh, you know, being a police officer is just like any other job. Sometimes you go to work with passion. You want to change the world. Sometimes you drag yourself out of bed and you just want to go back to sleep as soon as you can. So it's not impossible that these two police officers are just like fed up with all this bullshit. They go to visit people at all hours of the day and night. They talk to lots of weird people, strange people. Usually nothing happens. So maybe they feel like this is just another one of those days. We really don't want to, to have to do anything. This interpretation also fits with Edgar Allan Poe's other stories. I mentioned last week that he is the inventor of the detective story. And we know that usually in the world of the detective story, the reason you need a detective is because the police can't solve the crime. 
And the reason the police can't solve the crime is either because they're stupid or because they're lazy. Um, so this un this characterization of the police is consistent with Allan Poe's other stories. Uh, for example, last year when I was teaching this course, I had uh, students read a detective story instead. And um, in that story, the police did a fantastic job gathering evidence, gathering clues. They had every single piece of information. There's nothing more that they could have done to gather more information. They simply did not know how to put all of that information together into the answer. So in that case, the police were stupid. Uh, but in other cases, uh, the police follow a procedure, right? When a crime happens, you ask for witnesses, you collect the physical evidence, you take pictures, you do chemical tests. But after they do all of that and they still don't have the key information, they just stop. Like they have used all of their procedures, they don't know what else to do. In those cases, the police are lazy. Um, so that could also be a possible answer. The truth is, as one group mentioned, this story is told from the first person and the protagonist is also the narrator and he's crazy. He's not very trustworthy. So from his perspective, it seems like the police don't have a reaction, but we don't know why because he doesn't think about why. If he were really as aware of everything as he says he is, he would be aware that the police are not reacting. He would think about why is this the case, and maybe he would actually get away with killing the old man. So in terms of the evidence, we have two possible answers, two or three possible answers. Question three. One group took this question. Perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. So like everybody has a sense of being perverse. One of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments. Indivisible just means like it's it's not made up of different parts. This is a fundamental part of being human. And it gives direction to the character of man, which means it guides human behavior. This fact of be, of having perverse thoughts and doing perverse actions is a key to understanding human behavior. So one group took this question and they agreed. They said, even though the protagonist is crazy, we can't trust everything he says. But in this case, what he says makes sense. Everybody, good or bad, sometimes has some evil they this group said evil thoughts we can say strange ideas ideas about doing things we know are not a good idea to do it could be big like this guy like killed his beloved disabled cat could be small like you know you're not supposed to cross the road here but you do it anyway but there does seem to be some part of human nature that is rebellious, like we see some kind of rule and part of us thinks, why can't we? Right, if I, I don't know, if I say you have to hand in an assignment before next week, a part of you might think, what if I don't? Or what if I hand it in late? What would happen? This does seem to be something that I think everybody experiences. Um, and there are, in fact, many famous cases throughout history. Um, St. Augustine, Sun Augustine, his entire story, his entire life story is about realizing that he kept following these bad thoughts. And when he realized this, he decided to reform himself and follow God. Uh, so he became a saint, right? Sun it's kind of funny, though, because like in, in his story, he says, I realized I was being evil and I decided to change my ways. And so I prayed to God, uh, please help me become a better man, but not today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, so even when he realizes this, he also still can't help himself yet. 
Um, so how does this help us understand human behavior? Um, so when I was talking with this group, uh, the conclusion was that we have to remember that humans are not machines, so we are not 100% rational. That when we have these strange thoughts, sometimes we follow them, even when it, we know it's a bad idea. So when you design policy or when you make laws, when you make plans for people, when you design buildings, when you create procedures for people, you should always remember that making the right choice, the reasonable choice, is not always enough because sometimes people will act in unreasonable ways. You also, in, in, uh, in addition to making the right choice, the reasonable choice, you should also design some mechanism to prevent people from making the wrong choice or to design some kind of mechanism to take care of the situation when somebody makes the wrong choice. Uh, so like when engineers design systems, they always design redundancies, 重复的机制, because they know that maybe one day somebody will forget to do this thing. So they have to have a, a system in place to take care of it when they forget. Or like uh, when you design a building, you have to have more than one emergency exit uh, in every direction because maybe like during an emergency, uh, somebody will forget which one is the nearest door and they will run in the opposite direction. So like we, when you do planning involving humans, you should remember that people are sometimes unreasonable. Same here for me, like when I teach, uh, I give you the grading structure. I tell you what you have to do to pass the course. I give you deadlines, etc. I give you all the materials that you need, but I know that not everybody will do the reasonable thing. Uh, and so in class, I also uh, join you and help you work out some of these ideas so that even if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, I hope you still have the chance to learn something when you come to class. Question four, uh, one and a half groups took this question. Uh, so in the black cat, we have the description of two deaths. One is of the protagonist's beloved disabled cat. The other one is of his beloved able-bodied wife. Which one is worse? It, when I say worse, I mean like when you read it, it feels more horrible. So let's take a look at the cat's death, 17. Okay, so he has this cat, right? Uh, it's a disabled cat. It's a really cute cat, loves him a lot, very considerate animal. One morning, in cool blood, so he's not angry, I slipped a noose about its neck, so a rope around its neck, and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart. So even as he's killing the cat, he feels remorse. He feels like this is not th what he should be doing. Hung it because I knew that it had loved me and because I felt it had given me no reason of offense. It did not offend me. Hung it because I knew that in so doing, I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. So he knows that killing this cat is so evil that maybe God himself would not be able to save him. And he says he kills the cat because it is so evil. Uh, and so we have like the description of him crying and then he's thinking about how he shouldn't be doing this. Um, so it's a very dramatic scene, right? Even the language here is so dramatic. All of these uh, dashes, right? His own thoughts are interrupting himself. Let's compare this with when he kills his wife. Page 19. Um, 
second to last paragraph. So at this point in the story, he keeps on seeing this cat everywhere. He knows the cat's dead. Uh, and yet the cat seems to have come back and is now like following him around. One day she, his wife, accompanied me upon some household errand, some chores, into the cellar of the old building, so the basement, which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs. So already we kind of feel like it's a horror story. The steep stairs. And nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness. So the idea is they all go down the stairs and the cat kind of makes him almost trip. <laughs> uh, he almost trips over the cat. And he, it makes him very angry and also like crazy. Madness again means crazy. Uplifting an axe. So I'm not sure why he's holding an axe. But anyway, he holds up his axe and forgetting in my wrath, he's so angry, he forgets the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand. So like... He's afraid of this cat because it feels like this cat came back from the dead, right? So he's afraid of it. But now he's so angry, he forgets his fear. And I aimed the blow at the animal, which of course would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. So he's striking the cat, but his wife stops him. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal. His wife interrupts him, which makes him even more angry. Therefore, I withdrew my arm from her grasp, uh, so beats Hozo, and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished. <laughs> totally emotionless, right? After I killed her, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is quite different from the scene with the cat, right? As he's killing the cat, he's like crying. He knows this is a bad idea. But here when he's killing his wife, he's basically like, how dare you stop me? Huh. Now she's dead. Okay, let's bury the body. Like very different feeling here. Um, so the question is, why? Why is the death of the cat portrayed as so much worse than the death of his dear beloved wife? I heard a few answers uh, from different groups. One group said that um, it's because killing the cat took longer because, you know, he had to grab the cat, which is itself not an easy thing to do. Uh, then he had to hang the cat by the tree and had to wait for the cat to die. So it gave him more time to think about what he was doing. Which kind of makes sense. But then after he kills his wife, he also has lots of time to think about what he just did. And instead of stopping to think, oh, how terrible, I didn't mean to kill my dear beloved wife. Instead, he says, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. So very next thought. Okay, here's a dead body. How do I hide this body? So another reason I heard is that um, because the cat had been on his mind for such a long time, the entire beginning of the story is about how he used to love this cat and then slowly it annoyed him and finally he started hating this cat precisely because the cat loved him so much. Whereas his wife in this story is just kind of there. She doesn't really have any effect on him except being uh, his punching bag. Like whenever he's angry, he yells at his wife and his wife kind of just takes it. So because the protagonist himself is more focused on the cat, therefore when he kills the cat, he has, it's, it's much more emotional and gives him much deeper thoughts 
than when he kills his wife, who he doesn't think about very much. Also, could be true. I mean, I, and it kind of shows like how crazy he is, right? The woman he married is less important to him than this cat that just basically just follows him around. Um, but there's also a connection here with um, the idea of pets themselves, like how we think about cute little animals versus how we think about other people. Your boyfriend may cheat on you, but your cat will always be exactly the same amount of adorable and annoying. So the idea here being like, when we think of people, we know that as in question three, they are not always rational. They are not always dependable. They all have the freedom to do whatever they actually want to do. But pets, we usually think of as uh, dependably supportive or not supportive, depending on your animal. Like their personality is pretty predictable. We don't have to worry that one day your cat will fall in love with another human. So in this sense, especially for people who like pets, killing a pet is much worse than killing a person. Even in this story, right, he says he killed his wife because she stopped him from killing the cat and made him angry. He gives a reason for killing his wife. Like it's something that she did. It's blaming the victim. But for the cat, he keeps saying there's no reason to kill this cat. There's every reason not to kill this cat. And yet he kills the cat anyway. So uh, the reason that killing the cat is portrayed as even worse than killing a human is because we think about these two very differently. Pets are always innocent and adorable, whereas humans sometimes are not. And finally, question five, nobody took this question, therefore it's my question. Uh, there are often horror stories. Do you agree? Why or why not? So one way to think about horror stories is horror stories are supposed to be scary. Do you think these two stories were scary? A little bit. They're not like, and then a monster jumped out, that kind of scary, right? But they are scary in the sense that they show you how crazy and dangerous some people can be, right? Whether it's a dude who kills his neighbor because he doesn't like the way he looks at him, or whether it's a dude who kills his cat because his cat loves him too much. Uh, either way, these are dangerous and crazy dudes. And that that is scary, but it's not like the kind of immediate scary. It takes some thinking. You have to think about what kind of person is this? What kind of situation is this? And the more you think about it, the scarier it feels. So today we don't call this scary. We call this creepy, right? Mogusongren. But there's another sense in which uh, these are horror stories, and it's the elements included in the story. When we watch a horror movie or we read a horror story, we expect some things, uh, we expect to see some things. We expect some scenes to be dark. We, accept, we expect people to behave in strange, unexplainable ways. We expect the environment to be full of danger. Uh, and we see these things in these stories, right? Uh, the first guy kills the old man in the middle of the night. He spent most of the story happens at night with no light. He covers the light. So it's completely dark environment. Um, the protagonists of both stories behave in strange and unexplainable ways. And the environments are all very um, full of danger. Like in the first story, he hides the guy's, the dead man's body under the floorboard of his house. So he's like walking around on top of the body. Can you imagine if one day somebody walks into your house, digs a hole and discovers a dead body? 
Uh, and then in the second story, we just mentioned that uh, he kills his wife on a set of very steep stairs going underground. Um, at, right after he kills the cat, his house burns down and he loses everything. So the environment is also full of uh, danger and threat. Uh, and so like in terms of the elements of a horror story, these stories are full of horror elements. And in that sense, they are horror stories. OK, do you have questions or thoughts about uh, today's discussion? OK, let me introduce next week's reading. Next week, we're going to read two short essays about slavery, or at least when we read them, I want you to think about slavery. Slavery is, of course, a very important part of American history, and uh, reading these two essays can help us think about the issue and how people dealt with the fact of slavery. The first piece is Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I guess. So it's a real speech. Gettysburg was the site of one of the deadliest battles of the American Civil War. Happened at Gettysburg, uh, Pennsylvania. And so after the battle in 1863, the North won the battle. So Lincoln could safely go and give a speech, right? And in this speech, this is one of, I think it's the second shortest speech by an American president. The shortest speech by an American president is the second inaugural speech of George Washington. When Washington was elected president for the second time, he basically said, thank you, let's get to work. Very short speech. Um, this one is like the second shortest. And it's a speech that basically says so many people died in this place. They died for a reason, and that reason is because they believed in a United States of America, one United States of America, one country, not two. And so we have to work harder to make our country better in their memory. That's the basic idea of the speech. And we can compare that to the second essay. On the same page, this is by Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a former enslaved person. He ran away to freedom. Uh, so while he was a slave, he learned how to read and he made a plan to escape to the north and he ran away successfully and became a free black man in the north. And he dedicated the rest of his life to campaigning against slavery and trying to convince white people to end slavery. And he did this in two main ways. First, he gave fantastic speeches. Giving a speech is not just about the words, right? It's a performance. His performances were electrifying, energetic, powerful, convincing speeches. Unfortunately, he lived in the middle of the 19th century, so we don't have a video recording. But the speeches that he wrote are also very good. The second thing that he did is he wrote about his own life, how he be, uh, went from an uneducated enslaved young boy into a highly educated, highly polished public speaker. And his life proved that black people did not deserve to be slaves because they were stupider than white people, that this is not true. So we're going to read part of his speech. What to the slave is the 4th of July? The 4th of July is American Independence Day. It's the day when Americans celebrate their country and their history. And the point of this speech is not the full speech, but it um, so he gave a longer speech and then he took part of it and published it in his newspaper. He had his own newspaper. Uh, and so we're going to read the part that he published. The main idea of this speech is, um, so on the 4th of July, a group of women who were campaigning against slavery invited him to give a speech about anti-slavery 
um, and he realized that this was a great opportunity to talk about the American Independence Day and how it feels different for free white people and enslaved or formerly enslaved black people. So the main idea of this speech is while all you white people are celebrating the birth of the United States, we black people are still thinking about when will we have our independence? When will we also be able to celebrate our freedom? So both speeches are about the idea of America. What kind of country do we want? What kind of country are we becoming? But it's from two very different perspectives. Questions? Yeah, okay, so go home, read these two speeches, and we'll talk about them next week.